Another calendar year draws to a close as we end 2012. On the American scene, Chief Justice John Roberts validates Obamacare, while Barack Obama defeats Mitt Romney rather soundly for a second term. The nation mourns the tragic murders of 21st graders and six faculty members at a Newtown, Connecticut elementary school, generating a renewed focus on gun control. And Egyptian President Mohamed Morsi is considered for Time Magazine's Man of the Year. And the artist wins the Oscar for Best Picture, while at Broadway, the Tonys go to Clybourne Park, once, and a surprise winner, the Gershwins, Porgy and Bess. But what about the Jewish world? What were the most significant events to impact the Jewish people in 2012? What were the biggest disappointments? What were moments of triumph? And is there anyone who could be called the Jewish Person of the Year? These are the questions we'll be discussing with our thoughtful and wonderful year-end panel that includes Micah Halpern, syndicated columnist and publisher of his own blog, The Micah Report, and the author of Thugs, which chronicles how history's most notorious despots transformed the world. Dr. Stephen Baim, director of the Contemporary Jewish Life Department of the American Jewish Committee and of their Kaufman Institute, on American-Jewish-Israeli relations. Neil Schur, an attorney in private practice in New York, who is a former director of APAC and the former head of the Justice Department's Office of Special Investigations that hunted Nazi war criminals. And Susie Rosenbluth, the outspoken editor of The Jewish Voice and Opinion, a monthly journal promoting classical Judaism. All joining us this week on our year-end L'Chaim Roundtable. Thank you all for joining me. It's like sitting with friends again, and I appreciate it very, very much. Good to have you all here. So you heard what we're interested in, in is beginning with you know, trying to locate for our audience. And it'd be interesting to hear what our audience also has to say. I hope they'll be emailing us. What were the most significant events of 2012 from a Jewish perspective? I emailed all of you and sort of asked you to think that through. And I'm very anxious to hear whether you disagree, you agree. But Mike, I want to begin with you. As you look back at 2012, from the Jewish perspective, the most important event of 2012. Well, there's always a, a problem in having these discussions, and that is that we always sort of remember the most recent things. Yes. And so that's a, a sort of a trap. And I tried to break down that trap and break away. And the reality is that I couldn't, because the two most important events of the year, for me at least, was um, the UN resolution mm -hmm. to change the status of the Palestinians uh, to member non-statehood in, uh, in the United Nations. And then before that, Operation uh, Defense, uh, Pillar of defense. defense. Those are the two uh, major issues that really struck me in okay. the course of the year. Let me interrupt you. They're on my top, they, they top my list. But I'm curious to know, do we all agree or did any of you have another event in 2012 <laughs> that you thought was more important than either the UN vote or Pillar of Defense? I hope that your reason, I'm not sure your reason for pillar of defense was mine. Yes, we'll discuss that in a minute. <laughs> okay. Why? But would you have said that that was number one or two? I would have said culminating in that because I thought it was the development of Iron Dome. Iron Dome, okay. Well, Steve? I don't disagree at all in terms of the overall importance. I think that uh, in terms of the internal Jewish agenda, the release of the uh, New York City Jewish population study has enormous implications for the future of the Jewish community, mm -hmm. in many ways much more long-range implications. That's so, fascinating. So in that sense, I can't say I fully, I don't say I disagree, but I think we need to expand the list a little to think in terms of what, uh, what will affect the future of the Jewish community. Okay. But I want to make sure I understand. If I had started with you. I would have started with the, both uh, the Gaza war, mini war, if you will, and the UN vote. You would have also. Yeah. Yeah. Neil? Yeah, I agree completely. I think the significance of the UN <clears throat> vote and and the uh, Hamas or the Gaza uh, uh, the violence and the war 
is significant in, in, a, in a greater context. It's not just those two events, it's what they represent, because I think there is tremendous significance for the future. And I also agree with Steve in terms of the, uh, the, the demographic study that recently came out. I think that has very significant, significant long-range impacts uh, in the diaspora in, in this country. I am thrilled you raised it and we will pay attention to it. I come back to you now, Micah. Yeah. Uh, as Susie says, the question is why? For you, you know, it, it, give me a capsule of why you started there with the UN vote. You said the UN vote first, yes. even before the pillar of defense. Yeah, I said the UN vote first. I, I've got to tell you that in doing research on this, I actually tried to figure out what else happened in the course of the year. And I went to the Google <laughs> site Zeitgeist, which so that gives you which was most Googled, which item was most Googled, period, yes. in the year 2012. And the most Googled item in 2012 was Whitney Houston. <laughs> so get Her that. Passing. Right, exactly. So that's the, sort of the context okay. uh, in terms of what we're th talking about, some really serious things, whereas um, the rest of the world might not be as uh, Googly sensitive as we are. Okay. That said, uh, I put the UN piece first because it, I think it was a, f a much broader issue. It touched to the breakdown of Israel's diplomatic ties in the world, the United States issues specifically with Israel, uh, the connection that was there. It placed a serious challenge as to when that Israel is the centerpiece for American Jewry. Uh, I think that it raised a lot of questions. How did which you do were that? Well, because a lot of American Jews said, what's the big deal? Yes, that's right. About this. And if that's the case, there was a major challenge to the centrality of Israel. Okay. And we saw that with regard to uh, B.J. B'nai Jeshwin's uh, um, announcement yeah. about this. It, it really shook, I think, really shook the foundation of what I was assuming and hoping for the future to assume was a, uh, an, an almost inextricably uh, connected part of Judaism okay. in the Jewish world. As succinctly as you can, if there are viewers watching right now who don't understand, so what's the big deal? They are not a permanent member of the, of the United Nations, they're not a formal state. If it's simply a symbolic recognition, why is it such a big deal? It's a big deal because fundamentally it's spat in the face of Israel, of the United States, and of a negotiated settlement. But the reality is that in order to move anywhere, you have to have the two parties sitting together. And this was exactly the opposite. Do you feel the same? What, was it spitting in Israel's face? And does it in some way get in the way of the possibility of negotiations? First of all, in terms of the, uh, the actual spitting in the face, so to speak, I heard that uh, almost directly, I think, from Prime Minister Fayyad. We met with him in, uh, in July, a small meeting with uh, university presidents that I take over to Israel. And he said, given that negotiations are going nowhere, we have no choice but to go to the UN. Um, the symbolism of November 29th, meaning yes. that uh, that's, the, that's the day of the, UN, of the famous UN vote in 1947. So in that respect, it's certainly a spitting in Israel's face. It's a way of saying uh, we'll never we'll never get a state out of out of out of negotiations. Therefore, we're just going to engage in unilateral declaration uh, coming from the United, uh, sanctioned by the United Nations. In terms of its practical impact, um, I think it's probably threefold. Number one is the the very tangible issue of the uh, uh, bringing Israel to account before the International Court of Justice. Yes. So in that sense, the International Criminal Court is a propaganda setback for Israel. And, and I want to make sure again everybody understands. Although they are not a permanent state member, by being elevated in status, they have now the right to participate in any UN commission or organization, including taking any issue to the world court. It doesn't mean they will, but they can. Exactly. And that's your point. Exactly. And so that means they could bring Israel or Israelis to, in some way, uh, charge them with crimes at the international court. But they can't. <clears throat> Israel is not a, Israel does not recognize the court. And the court that has doesn't mean they but can't. They can't. They can do it anyway. They've been yes, doing they it. Yes, can. they can. And but they Israel could, doesn't but recognize they couldn't it. do it. People are trying to absent you all the time. Exactly. That, 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 I mean it doesn't mean that's, anything. That's a tangible impact. What I'm actually much more concerned with is two other issues. Uh, number one is that uh, simply in terms of the international stage, uh, Israel lost what we call here the um, the moral minority. Mm -hmm. uh, in entire, entire right. Europe, the entire continent, only Czechoslovakia. Czechia. Uh, no. I'm sorry, the Czech <laughs> Republic, you're right. Um, only the Czech Republic voted uh, with Israel. Uh, the, the fact that there were abstentions, I guess, is better than voting against. Uh, but the bottom line is, is that we lost the moral minority in this respect. 
Uh, so in that sense, it's a propaganda setback for Israel. It's a statement, if you will, towards the greater delegitimization of Israel internationally. Mm -hmm. Lastly is the issue of uh, micro races that um, B'nai Jeshurun is very troubling to me because... Explain uh, what happened there. Okay, uh, B'nai Jeshurun as a congregation gets 2,000 people on Friday <coughs> night. It really is uh, considered to be the, uh, the poster child for Jewish renewal. They, it involves some of the most passionate, committed uh, Jews that I can think of. Uh, in that respect, it's a, it's a synagogue that really requires every bit of encouragement. And their rabbis are wonderful. And their rabbis are wonderful. Um, the UN vote was taken. Um, again, the immediate reaction in the circles that I traveled in, in terms of the Jewish establishment, is that uh, this was a very bad day. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, uh, uh, the only saving grace probably was the speech given by the Israeli ambassador, Ron Pressur, which I, I thought was a brilliant address. Uh, but Did you like Susan Rice's speech? Um, yeah, I did actually. Yeah, she was, was also quite, good. Was quite right. good. Um, but uh, the dominant reaction in, in the circles I travel with was one of sadness, mainly because of the issue with it. Uh, was, no one expected Israel would win, but we did expect the uh, what I call the moral minority, if you will, to stand mm -hmm. with us. And who would have been in that moral minority? Uh, basically all of Europe. Western uh, Europe, certainly. Western Europe, yeah. You expected Britain? Yeah. France? Yeah, absolutely. Germany. 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 Germany was perhaps, perhaps the biggest disappointment. Major because, disappointment. Uh, Germany's Italy's record on, on UN UN Israel related matters has been extremely yes. good for many many years. That said, immediately what happened is that uh, the rabbis of BJ uh, B'nai Jeshurun uh, issued a statement that uh, by any charitable interpretation would be called cheerleading mm -hmm. uh, for the vote supporting the Palestinian Declaration of uh, uh, of Independence. Um, Aside from the fact that um, I disagreed with the, uh, the cause for cheerleading, in other words, it was not a good day, uh, what was very surprising is, again, it did not come from those Jews who are indifferent. It did not even come from Jews who would regard themselves as being anti-Zionist or non-Zionist. It came from Jews who were passionately committed to the Jewish people. Yet, um, the timing of it, as well as the content, uh, was extremely disappointing. Uh, so in that now sense... Now, they did retract. The retraction, uh, I would not call an apology. It was very no. mild. They it made was... a correction that it was done sloppily. Uh, it was signed by some of the wrong people. Uh, mm -hmm. When I actually read it, I never really thought the executive director of the synagogue <laughs> was a real signatory. I thought it was based on the stationery. <laughs> um, but there was no apology for the content, excuse me. They apologized if they gave offense. For the timing. They apologized for the timing. Okay, the timing I, I'd be willing to accept, but there certainly was no apology for the content. Mm -hmm. And they said if we gave offense to people, we regret giving <coughs> offense. <coughs> Well, sure. Oh, wait, many people at BJ were outraged by it. Um, and that's in part why they had to take step back. That, I think that's, that's a fair comment, Mark, but I, I think it goes, it goes broader. What does it mean to you? And then what we'll, it means we'll is that you had respected Jewish leaders, whom I really do respect and admire their work enormously, put their particular ideology above the collective welfare of the Jewish people. And in that sense, I thought it was the wrong message at the wrong time and the wrong place. Yeah. Not, and obviously the New York Times didn't help matters by putting on the front page. Mm -hmm. I've got a, a, a sort of a different take on all of this. I agree with what was said, but uh, I think that uh, this has to be viewed, the Palestinian vote, mm -hmm. as the broader, as part of a broader war, and it is a war, to delegitimize the state of Israel. Of and. Uh, I'll go even further. I think the American organized Jewish community uh, fell flat, completely flat, for the following reason. That even though the United States did not vote for it, the simple fact of the matter is President Obama and his administration could have very easily cut this off at the knees. This is not the first time. Could they have? Absolutely. In the let General me, Assembly. Listen, in the GA, let me explain what happened. Years ago, under, I think it was Reagan and Bush won, it would have been Arafat, was making the same noise to elevate the status of the PLO to what just happened uh, a few weeks ago. And the respective administrations made it very clear in public statements that if that happens, the U.S. will cut off funding, mm -hmm. period. Mm -hmm. And guess what? The issue was never raised. Obama should have <clears throat> said the same thing. Rice should have said the same thing. They didn't. And one reason they didn't, I believe, is that American Jewish leadership, including my alma mater of APAC, did not push them. They did not push the administration. And they could have, and they should have. Uh, I think there were attempts. 
What's that? I think there were attempts. Well, and the general feeling that I had was that it wasn't going to make any difference, that this administration was not going to do well, it. Well, you know and what? They, have even, they even have been, have been efforts to make sure that you know, the Susie, Senate doesn't do anything. Susie, the, I'm telling you, APAC did not push it, and the mainstream organized Jewish community, the ones that would have some influence on the administration, did not push it. Oh, your mainstream Jewish efforts. organization, is he right? Look, uh, tw Neil, 12 months ago, we were, uh, we were convinced that uh, we would not, we're not going to prevail on this one in terms of the actual vote. Doesn't mean you don't fight it, though. We, our objective was to get as much support, particularly among liberal democracies. And in that respect, those liberal democracies, uh, by and large, failed us. And we certainly we placed our efforts on that scale. I know. Well, I, I think... I think the issue you're raising, it's, it's a false analogy with the, um, uh, the, the historical memory here of what took place with the PLO. Um, because... Um, in that, in that sense, we were lined up behind a specific position that no recognition, no negotiations with the PLO until such time as the PLO makes, makes changes right. in, its, in its approach. My, my main point is the United States government has tremendous clout if it wants to exert it within the United Nations. I think it's a misread. And the event... Well, they won't even allow it in the Senate. We have people I've, who are trying at this point who said they did this and they wanted to, and they wanted to put in bills to have a decrease in funding, mm -hmm. yep. and they and they received a tremendous amount of pushback from the administration to drop. They it. received pushback, and I tell you what else is at work. Mm -hmm. It's the fact that uh, the organized Jewish community is divided. You've got J Street, which which blows out of proportion its mm -hmm. own power, mm -hmm. but the fact of the matter is. They provide a shield for people in politics, in Washington, who, who are looking for an excuse, for example, not to push the United Nations. It's very simple. I think why did you, why did you say it's a misread? From, from, in one uh, sense. Uh, in, there are two elements that I think that are the misread. Um, the first, uh, first where you're correct is that the administration was not against, in principle, the establishment of the Palestinian state, which is one of the things that they, they voted against the... Uh, the proposal, but because, that was because of procedural right. issues, not because of uh, yes. of ideology. So that's a, that's one. But it's a misread. I'm because, sorry. Yeah. In terms of concept, yeah. they favored it. They favor a Palestinian favor state. Two states, but they've always favored, favored it. Right. We've all, so and they actually and they actually are pushing Israel to compromise more. But it's and two more states yes, after that a negotiated so settlement. That's, so that's, 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 why, they, that's, that's not, why they voted that's against not the so, issue. Right. And so we had that. Let's the say question, last year the in September. Is, last year was in September the, after the was the Palestinian Authority going to do an end run? Yeah, yeah. Yes. And I'll explain why that was why uh, Neil has a misread here. But last year after the general after the the uh, Security Council had their vote, and uh, the United States was very clear on that vote, uh, Susan Rice, the ambassador to the United Nations, said, we voted this way, but we don't agree with it. Okay, and it was very, very important to... Uh, Why is that to, a misread to, on my that's part? That's not the misread. That's oh, where you're right. Okay. The, misread, <laughs> the misread is the following. The misread is that the United States has almost no clout in the General Assembly, to the point where literally this is not just a failure of Israel. This was a terrible failure of the United States that eight other countries, eight, four are Pacific island nations with fewer than 100,000, with the largest Marshall Islands with 110,000 people in it. Uh, uh, Palau has uh, 11,000. Uh, Nehru has 9,000 people Neil in it. But Neil said something could not, different. Could not Neil, in any way, they could not okay, influence but Neil the General said Assembly. They didn't have to influence the General Assembly. All they had to do was influence they the Palestinians. They had to influence the right. Palestinians right. Here's not to go forward. So the Palestinians have, over the last six months and eight months, decided that their bread is going to be buttered on, uh, by the United States regardless of what they do. Exactly. They decided. And, and is that is, true? Yes. They said, we're willing to take the risk and, Neil and pay says the that's price. our fault. What? That, we're willing to take right the risk. We're willing to take the risk oh. and pay the price because the price is going to be temporary. Okay. Neil and you says know what the it's our was? fault. Is it, it, is it yes. the Jewish yes. establishment? So but, he's right, you're oh, saying. No, no, but I'm saying, <laughs> but not because of now, because of a six months or 12 months issue. Well, they said we're going to pay the price, and there was no pay, price Mika, to be paid. Mika, this is all a buildup, and I think you could see this coming with the administration. It, it's not really a surprise. My only point is. The power of the purse is a tremendous one, Amen. and the U.S. did not play that significant card. Ultimately, would have worked? I don't know, but they were not willing to do it, and we're hearing a lot of double talk. You and why weren't they Susan. willing to do it, in your mind? Because fundamentally, Mika's right, because they, they've taken the Palestinian side on this. There's no question about it. And the nomination just, or the, the prospective nomination of Chuck Hagel, 
to be uh -huh. the head of the DOD. Department that, of Defense. Department of Defense to take over Panetta, who is, 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 is stepping down, retiring. Part I mean, parcel Ch Chuck, ha Chuck Hagel, I knew this from my days at APEC. Chuck Hagel had a terrible record, not just on Israel. He wants to get in bed with Iran. He wants to make it nice with them. I mean, to the point where the National Jewish Democratic Coalition three or four years ago, <clears throat> I mean, had Chuck Hagel as the number one uh, bad guy, so to speak, on their list. Are you on the left? I, uh, no <laughs> one said I was on the left. No one. Uh, uh, never, never well, Hagel is a Republican. So. Okay. <laughs> uh, Hagel was a Republican. Was, was. And the point is, there are a lot of people who, who believe that uh, should he be nominated, and as we are speaking today, we don't know whether he'll be nominated, that it has to be interpreted in certain ways as a slap at Israel because Obama knows Hegel's record. He certainly knows it now because groups like the ADL and others have come out and saying the sky is, is bad news. And if he still gets nominated, I think it's very fair to say it's an intentional uh, slap at uh, Mr. Netanyahu. Do you have any other take on the uh, Just really just two comments, two quick footnotes, Neil. Okay. Number one is that um, uh, we'll certainly get back to the Gaza war, but if you're at, in, in terms of evaluating the administration, uh, the Obama administration during the days of the Gaza war made it crystal clear what moral clarity was all about. Uh, in terms of Hamas started it, Israel had a right to defend herself. So this notion that they've taken the Palestinian side, I, I think is, a, is an overstatement by far. As far as the specifics in terms of the UN vote is, uh, look, we, a year ago this thing was defeated in the Security Council. Mm -hmm. Uh, primarily through the efforts of number one uh, Jewish leadership and and United States, and leadership. I was I was very and, and and I think it was the Jewish leadership which led and and pushed the administration, which is the way things. I, I understand. Yeah. In the General Assembly, it was it was a foregone conclusion that this vote would be taken okay. and it would lose overwhelmingly. Therefore, as far as Obama and, and the administration is concerned. Look, there are all reason, There are good reasons to be concerned, and I certainly wouldn't uh, yeah. wouldn't negate with, wouldn't, wouldn't negate those reasons. But I also say, in the same breath, is that they came through for us in the Gaza War, where they thought the stakes were incredibly high. In terms of this uh, General Assembly vote, again, this, the assumption was is that it was going to pass. I wish they had been more forceful. Susan uh -huh. Rice's speech was very, very good, but bottom line is is that there was never an expectation. That would not pass the journalism. I see. You see, I see the vote in the UN, and I think we've all touched on it, as being so important because of what it says demographically about Western Europe and the relationship between Israel and these countries, who certainly had their issues with Israel, but we always thought we could count on when there was a, especially something that seems so clear that in order to resolve this issue, it was going to have to be through negotiations uh, between the parties. Um, I don't know whether anybody saw it, but Brussels, something very interesting happened in Brussels this past holiday season. For the first time in years, there was no Christmas tree in Brussels because there is a majority on the Brussels town council there was a Muslim majority, and they said it was offensive. They didn't want a Christmas tree. They put up a lighted cube for the holiday. And I think, I think what we're seeing in Western Europe, and I think it's something that has to be recognized, is philosophically, certainly, there's a tipping. But I think it, there's a demographic statement that's mm -hmm. being made. And I think it was simply a continuation of what we're seeing. Um, as far as the United States, yeah, the United States right now, I mean, like political reasons, they supported Israel and, and, and took the side that made sense. As you said, it was certainly not that they disagree with a Palestinian state, but they didn't like the procedural effort. It should have been done through negotiations. But there was, a, there's been a real effort by the administration to make sure that there is no payback for it. The, we, everybody was furious at UNESCO when UNESCO recognized uh, the Palestinian Authority as a full member, and there were all these efforts, we're going to cut off UNESCO, and we're not... Nothing. The money has Nothing come happened. back. Yeah. The money all came back. And I spoke to a number of um, Congress uh, members who said there was nothing that could be done. And what's the therefore? What do you think it means, Susie? I think it means we're in for four very hard years. 
I think we've got an administration that, it, well, my own feeling is that we have an administration that is not going to be particularly pro-Israel. I think Hegel, I don't, as we said, we don't know if he's going to be um, our next Secretary of Defense, but there certainly are enough trial balloons out there. Um, I, th I think that we're in for four very difficult years. Okay. I think we ha I think I think those of us who were worried about it before the election were correct to be worried, and I think now we're going to see the fruits of that. Okay, there's so much to cover that I want to sort of go on, but I want to ask one more question, and we're going to start with you, Neil. And I, I want a simple declarative <laughs> sentence, and just play the game with me. On a scale of one to ten, how bad is the vote? for Palestinian observer statehood in the UN, and in one sentence, what do you think the most serious result of it will be? One being the least, least significant. Least and ten the most. I, I put it at a seven or an eight, and I put it there because uh, uh, of, of the potential impact at the court. Uh, you know, Israel does not recognize the court. But the fact is, it's part of the war Absolutely. of delegitimization. Absolutely. I have some ideas of, of what should be done to counter that. But that's, but a, that's a separate discussion. issue. Right. Uh, but I, so I, it's the I, court for you. It, it, it's a seven it, and the court. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. What's the number and what's the worst thing that you fear could happen? Again, seven, seven eight is, uh, is, the right, is the right number. The court is the most critical issue. But I also think I, I'd have to add on to that that... Uh, this is a major setback in terms of uh, the negotiating process or the absence of a negotiating no process. process. You're worried it will hurt negotiations? It will, it will allow negotiations to go nowhere. Now, they're probably going nowhere anyway, but here's where I really disagree with Susan. A two-state solution is not something simply that the United States government wants. It's something that I think the Jewish people require uh, for a variety of reasons which we can get into. This is not a step towards a two-state solution. It is not. It is step not away. because. Because the only way of getting a two-state solution that, that Israel can all, can all live with is the idea of direct negotiations where people tell you point blank, we recognize Israel as a Jewish state. Why won't there be an, I don't understand why there still will not be direct negotiations. Where will the borders be? What land will here? Well, how will you work on refugees? What about Jerusalem and the capital? What are you doing about security for Israel? Why won't those things still need to be negotiated? First of all, there's been nothing stopping negotiations for quite some time now. In other words, except the Palestinian unwillingness to come forward to demand, uh, demand a settlement freeze as a precondition. Um, essentially, the message to the Palestinian polity is that there is more to be gained by having recourse to the international arena, uh -huh. applying greater pressure on Israel. Exactly. Sooner or later, there'll be the abandonment of Israel, and then we'll have our Palestinian Very good. state. Okay, same question. What's the number and what's the worst thing you fear? Well, I actually put the number much lower. I put the number closer to the four. And the reason I put the number four is because the reality is that there's no significant damage on the ground with the peace process, period. This is about the creation of the Palestinian state. It has not changed anything. Do you disagree with Steve? No, I don't disagree on the issue of the International Criminal Court and the potential damage but he, on the But he also level. believes it will. Yeah. Uh, it, it sort of it encouraged it empowers, it empowers them. on yeah. the part of the Palestinians. Right. It empowers them, but not on the, uh, in ways, it empowers them in ways which they were already moving towards anyhow. They want, to, uh, they want to do things independent of Israel. They've always wanted to do that. The United States and Israel have always tried to keep okay. it together. So it's a four. It's a, it's a four. And, and the worst thing? The worst could... damage that I see is not on the international level. I see it on the Jewish level. In what, what way? I saw, and I uh, made, mentioned this earlier, the biggest damage I see is that it gives voice to people who, uh, um, to question Israel's right within the Jewish community. That suddenly the centrality of Israel and its importance is not a universal phenomenon within, within, uh, within the Jewish community now. And that frightens me. And I think that that has far greater significance, uh, to me at least, than these other issues which are more procedural. Okay. And Susie? I was going to say five. But when you said four, I started thinking, you know what? <laughs> I'll, I'll go with your four. I'll second your four. Um, yeah, I don't think on the ground, and I think that's, that's going to make any difference. And I think that's one of the problems. Because I think what always happens for the Palestinians is that their expectations get raised, whether it's through some kind of rhetoric that's given, whether it's through something that happens here with this vote. And I think there's this, all, this kind of, oh, terrific, and then nothing happens, because nothing can happen. 
uh, there's not going to be any change. Um, I'm not so sure I would go along with you. I don't, I don't think, I'll say it, I don't think in our lifetime we're going to see a two-state solution. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know whether it's, a, whether it's good for the Jewish people or they want it or they don't want it. I don't think we're going to get there. I don't think we're going to get there because I think at the base level it is something that the Palestinians are not going to accept. I think what we saw happen when just recently when Abbas made what was a very daring statement on Israeli TV that he wanted to see, I think, Sfat, but he didn't, but he wasn't expecting to be able to go back there and live. And, I mean, the roof fell in on him. He was, he, I mean, the criticism, I mean, someone said his life was in danger. Um, he had to backtrack as best he could and, well, this was only my personal feeling. I'm not making a, a statement for the Palestinians in general. So we're not talking about backtracking at all on anything that the Palestinians have wanted. Um, let's not even go ahead to talking about recognizing Israel as a Jewish state, which they, th there's no indication of that happening. If anything, the rhetoric seems to be even stronger. Um, so that, do I think that the court will be a problem? I think it'll be a problem only insofar as it continues the demonization that we've seen. It'll get some publicity. Do I think that Israelis are, we're gonna see Israelis on the dock? in the international, no more than we've seen Americans. Maybe they'll be tried in absentia. Um, I think it might be kind of interesting. Uh, Israel, because it doesn't recognize the court, isn't going to start bringing Palestinians there who might be guilty of mass murder. So I don't think we're going to start seeing but, that but kind of tit other people can. Maybe. Other people that can. would be an interesting idea. That, that if we saw some mass murdering on the, on the part of the Palestinians, my goodness, can you imagine meant? that? That's what I meant. I have some ideas, but yeah, maybe okay. for another time. It might be an interesting. Huh? I, I like to, to hear that. Okay. I, I want to <laughs> ask the four of you to comment on another event. It does not rise to the level of either the UN vote or Operation Pillar of Defense. But for me, it was very significant, and I want to know whether any of the four of you agree. <clears throat> It was the speech given by Khaled Mashal when he triumphantly returned after his exile to Gaza. And he gave this speech, which was quoted virtually verbatim mm -hmm. in the New York Times, in which he said, Palestine is our land and nation from the sea, he meant the Mediterranean Sea, to the river, meaning the Jordan River, from north to south, we cannot cede an inch or any part of it. We will never mm. recognize the legitimacy of the Israeli occupation. He's not talking about the West Bank. He's talking about Haifa, Jerusalem, Tel Aviv. And therefore, there is no legitimacy for Israel, no matter how long it takes. We will free Jerusalem inch by inch, stone by stone. Israel has no right to be in Jerusalem. And then he also pointed out that they were going to kidnap other Israeli civilians and soldiers, just like Gilad Shalit had been captured. I read this and I say to myself, there is an enormous desire among well-meaning American Jews. I consider myself among them. I want to believe there is a Palestinian moderate leadership which might be developed that the Jewish people and the state of Israel almost has a responsibility to do everything it can to foster a partner that would say, honestly, we will live with you in peace. But Michal gets up here and says what Jews inside the Jewish world have been saying all along. They really want our destruction. I did not hear an administration condemnation of Michal. I have not seen the New York Times, while reported it, then softened the impact that it was supposed to have on the reader. And my own feeling is that if <coughs> a Michal can say this in public, and at the moment everybody's talking about some kind of cooperation between Fatah and Hamas, how does the Jewish world and how does the world in general believe that it is possible right now for there to be 
honest negotiations between Israel and the Palestinians for a two-state mm -hmm. solution, no matter how much we would love to see that happen. Micah, to what extent do you think Michelle's speech is significant, or am I overblowing it? You're not overblowing it at all. And Khaled Mashal is an extremely important character, but there's some context that's important. The first is one person who mm -hmm. did reject the speech was Abbas, who made it very clear that this does not what represent. What do you mean? I did not hear him reject it. Oh, so, um, but I'm reading the Palestinian press, and so he and came he out said very what? clearly. He very clearly said that we re we recognize the state of Israel and did. Now, there's a Jewish state, which so is an interesting Abbas addition to that. But we criticized Michal. Michal. Now, I need to explain something from the internal point of view. Two extremely important elements. First, the Khalid Michal was killed by the Mossad and was brought back to life in the following way. Now, this is important. So, in uh, oh, you mean in, literally? He, he was yeah. poisoned. He was, he was poisoned by a spritz in the ear by two Mossad agents in Jordan. In Jordan, in the Mon Jordan, and in the process of that, the two Mossad agents. There were three Mossad agents there. Two of them were actually captured by his driver, who was a jujitsu expert or something like that, which is a major embarrassment. They captured him. They captured the uh, the agents. Khalid Mashal went to the hospital and was dying, literally dying, in an exchange or in negotiations um, for the antidote. For this poison, the two Mossad agents and the third were exchanged back to Israel, along with the blind sheikh, <laughs> uh, Sheikh Ahmed Yassin, who was supposed to be dying but didn't die for another five years until Israel killed him in the helicopter uh, gunship. Now, what's interesting and important here is they gave the antidote, he came back to life, and gave him a whole new energy in terms of the leadership of Hamas. The next thing that's important to understand is that their objective in Hamas right now is twofold. The first that everyone talks about, and we're talking about that here, is the destruction of Israel. He made that clear. The second, which is actually primary now, is the destruction of the Palestinian Authority. And if there is, we're on the rise now of a near third intifada, which is happening in the uh, Palestinian Authority right now. It's being engined by Hamas. Their objective is to oust the PA. And by doing that, only through that force will they have the fulcrum, the tools, to then attack Israel, but they want to get rid of Abbas. So there's talk, you know, behind, uh, you know, we hear Egypt wants to bring them together. It's not going to happen. For years now, they've signed deals. They've never been able to get together. But right now, even worse, the Hamas leadership wants Abbas out. Who do you put your money on? Hamas. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, uh, look, so, if you look what happened in yeah, Gaza, right. so, I mean, how they took over. The they, they literally, they ousted huh? exactly the, they the same way. <clears throat> and so what we're seeing now, this third intifada, which is on the verge right now, when you see the, the YouTube videos that they're sending out, and, you, and they're, they're, um, Hamas is sending out to their uh, oh. adherents, which is trying to get more and more young people to get excited about challenging Israeli roadblocks. If Abbas's people come and challenge Hamas, it just adds, okay. adds Does this uh, mean fuel to the fire. There is greater militancy within Hamas? Let's be clear. The, one of the reasons the speech, I was well aware of it, one of the reasons it never made my list, so okay. to speak, is that uh, you read the Hamas covenant. It's right the there. entire speech no is surprise. there. That's 25 it's years ago. If anything, you wanted... He said nothing new in this. He said right? nothing new. It's the only, the only thing that's missing, from... frankly, is the uh, in the Hamas covenant, there are all sorts of statements about kill the Jew behind every tree. Somehow or other, he managed to omit that. Um, so in terms of the speech itself, it never rose to that level. The only reason I put it on is you know about it. I know about it. When it's printed <clears throat> like this in the New York Times, it's impossible for ordinary people not to know it. Okay, let's... Uh, in terms of that, obviously, uh, the New York Times is a a major organ, and it's, it's done us a good number of disservices in the past. <laughs> I think it'll do so in the future. But bear in mind, there are forces in America that really have been marginalized, that have been, argue, I don't know if marginalized may be too strong a word, they've not been listened to. There are forces in America that say, well, the next step is we should have negotiations with Hamas. The administration has rejected that. Uh, the Israelis reject it, and, and rightfully so. Um, in that sense, it seems to me the, the immediate reaction remains is that there was moral clarity, as I said, during the Gaza war, that the administration was on record as saying Hamas started it, and Israel has to defend herself. Um, so in that sense, this speech, number one, didn't say anything new. Mm -hmm. I don't think it, um, I hope anyway, it doesn't presage any shift in American foreign policy uh, towards mm -hmm. uh, empowering those who say, let's negotiate with Hamas. As far as the two-state solution is concerned, again, uh, the Palestinian Authority has not been... Um, has not given us much cause for cheer in this regard. Um, but it seems to me the, the natural reaction ought to be is that if Abbas repudiates this speech, if Fayyad certainly wants to see a Palestinian state, 
the natural reaction ought to be condemn this speech, say neg negotiations with Hamas are not possible, but let's do whatever possible to reach some agreement with the PA. Do I think that will happen during our lifetimes? Can't speak about my lifetime. I hope it'll last quite some long. I do too. I do too. I do too. See it as happening anytime in the, in the, near, in the near, near to midterm future. But I certainly want to keep the door open to it. And I think the message of the Jewish community, though, over and over again, has to be that absent a two-state solution, um, we have a disaster in the making in terms of Israel for demographic and social and cultural reasons. I want to just ask you one last question. To what extent is Mashal's articulation? the articulation you believe that is either implicit or explicit within the Palestinian Authority? The leadership of the Palestinian Authority is a far more pragmatic leadership. What they want to do, at least ostensibly, is improve the situation on the ground. Fayyad is busy uh, conducting, uh, creating an infrastructure. He wants to create this million-dollar suburb uh, outside of Ramallah. Uh, those are the kinds of steps that presumably will enhance, enhance the situation on the ground. So is it important for Jews to feel, American Jews to feel, there are, and I, I'm, again, this is a slogan, but still I'm going to ask it, there are good Palestinians and bad Palestinians? Hamas are the bad Palestinians, and Fatah, PA, are the good Palestinians? I, I wish it were that simple. <laughs> I, but I think American Jews have to say over and over again is let's acknowledge the mistake of Oslo. The assumption behind Oslo was that we've turned over a new leaf, that the rejectionism of Israel that had been so constant from 1947 down to 1993 is no longer operative. We, we assumed that that was the foundations of Oslo. It turns out not to be the case with Arafat. Mm -hmm. uh, we can't go back to an Oslo-type situation uh, until such time as those assumptions are proven correct, that we're willing to bury the rejection of Israel and, and try to live with Israel in relative peace in a two-state solution. I think one of the immediate impacts of uh, Michelle's speech uh, will be for uh, there to be efforts on the part of the U.S. to prop up Abbas with more money and more support. And in <coughs> fact, Israel might be doing the same thing. Uh, uh, How but, do you answer my question about the good Palestinians and the bad Palestinians? Well, I mean, it, I, I don't think you can just, it, put, I wouldn't put it in those terms, but I'll tell you one thing. If one follows the Palestinian Authority TV which they control, and radio, and the organization Memory, which simply translates mm -hmm. what, what they say, it, it's pretty scary. And there's not much distinction. The PA is scary, too? Yes. There's not much distinction of what they're saying to themselves, to their own people. Uh, it's, it's comparable to what Absolutely. Michelle saying. And if I, Absolutely. So that, I asked that of Steve. He seemed yeah. to say no. Are you saying to me that you feel that what Michelle is saying is, in fact, sentiments that were, are within the PA as well? Well, that's certainly what you're seeing on PA radio and TV and in their own publications. That is what they are saying, and that is what they are teaching their young people. When the school books that are being used, with, despite all of the arguments that they were going to be changed, they're still showing the maps of Palestine that do not have any Israel in them. There's, there, is, um, there is no attempt at, at discussing how we're going to live in peace with, yeah. with, with Israelis. You know, I, the one other point I would add is uh, that uh, with all the help that they might be giving to Abbas and, and the discussion we're having now, it's going to come down to a power play. And as Mika, you said, and I agree with you, I bet the mortgage on Hamas. Okay. It's the same Does message. The, it's is, the same message. Is there a nuanced difference between what you're hearing now and your own position? Or do you feel, as you listen to them, they're right? <laughs> my, my, look, my fear is, without question, that uh, the kinds of sentiments you're hearing uh, from Hamas are echoed on the ground. I think there was enormous mistakes made during Oslo that uh, no one paid much attention to the curriculum, to what was being said in the, in the mosques. Uh, the kind of um, on-the-ground change of opinion, uh, change of education, that's necessary for a real two-state solution was totally missing during the Oslo yeah. years. Oslo was a peace between elites, and as a result, we need to learn from that. Yeah, there's a synapse here. There's a significant problem, and everyone's focusing on it. The leadership itself of the PA understands what needs to be said and needs to be done on an international level. They know what it needs to happen in order to get money in. Right? They know how to get it from the United States. They know how to get it from the Arabic world and from the EU. They know that. They don't know how to translate that message 
to their younger generation. Uh, because or they're don't afraid, want to. or they don't want to. Okay, that's a, they're afraid fundamentally that there will be a rebellion, <clears throat> so they're uh, and that they will be catapulted out. And if that's the case, because of a popular uh, disdain and rejection of the basic message, so it's very hard to say I want to pursue peace. These are words that are difficult for um, for Palestinian leaders to say. But how do you answer the question I asked Neil? I'm sorry, uh, Steve. Initially, is basically Michelle's message the real message of the PA, or do they have a different commitment? I think there is a different There's a more realistic... You I'm disagree with Neil. You I'm disagree with Neil. But the leadership Susie. has a pragmatic understanding of how to move ahead. And pragmatism is a fundamental reality in okay. Islamic... And how do you answer, in, Susie, what about in the Islamic politics forever. So pragmatism is important. The problem is that there's also the pragmatic, which says if they go too far, they will be ousted. Not ousted democratically, ousted by physical... Nika, you follow the Palestinian Very press, right? Very Do you see any difference, really, between the material coming out of the no. PA the or tone, out of Hamas? The tone of the press, especially the kids shows, especially the kids shows, and the coverage. Of what happened. Children just are look learning. at just look at the 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 terror attack on the last Wednesday of Operation Pillar of Defense in in Tel Aviv. The way it was covered across the board in Palestinian press, whether it be in Hamas press or PA press, was almost exactly the mm -hmm. same. A celebration of Israel's demise okay. and the death, and really celebrating death. Thankfully, there were no deaths, there were just injuries. This was a celebration I want to squeeze death. one more <laughs> issue in before we have to pause. <laughs> Israel responded after the vote by declaring it was going to build in E1 a section between Maale Adumim and Jerusalem, and they were going to build more housing in East Jerusalem. And the, the idea was in some way that they were building on land that they had avoided building on before. And there was a response to it. And the response, even as we're taping today, we read people are continuing to discuss this. Again, I just want a, a sense real quick, on a scale of 1 to 10, how bad was Israel's decision, if it was bad at all, What's the consequence of that announcement? Well, fundamentally, it was tit for tat. It was uh, spiteful. It was spiteful against the United States, especially not against the Palestinians. Surprisingly, it was spiteful. It was spiteful. But it was Israel not, wanted to stick it, it totally to the United their, States. Yes, it's totally within their right to do that because they was it wise? control their destiny. It was deliberately a slap against the United States, and I say it was it wise. It was diplomatically uh, not not appropriate because they're going to take the flack, and they're taking the flack. It's as simple as that, as they continue to. But Israel says it, they are the masters of their destiny. They can decide to do it. It is not a strange, E1 is not a new phenomenon. It was under Yitzhak Rabin's uh, direction that was created. It is not the maps that you see, by the way, and even the maps that you see in the New York Times and everywhere else, totally out of proportion. It's 4.6 square miles. It's really very small area. And you see the maps, the Palestinian map is amazing. E1 looks like three times the size of <laughs> Jerusalem when you look at the Palestinian map. It's just wrong. You know, when you look at it, it's, very, uh, it's not... Was not the Israeli enough. announcement significant or not? No, it's not significant. It's saying what they've always said, and they're going to continue to, uh, to build, because Israel expands and continues to build its settlements. It reminded me very much, I don't know if you remember when Sharon was prime minister, and he made a statement to the Bush administration in which he said that um, Israel will not play Czechoslovakia. Mm -hmm. And the Bush administration went crazy. And Sharon said, well, I didn't exactly mean that you're Czechoslovakia. My feeling was it was a matter of Israel standing up. And I'm not sure it wasn't done against the Palestinians also. To I'm say, you're going to do, aren't strong enough you're to going to do this. We're going to do this. Israel doesn't if you're going to, to say, you know, there are many American Jews who thought it was just Childish. Whenever, you know, when, when, when I hear that, when you marry many American you know what, Jews, you, without question, yeah. who, who think that it's childish, I'm always going back, and I know we're going to get to it later, to our demographic study. And what our demographic study shows. Okay, we'll get to and it. And where the people are going okay, we'll who are it. thinking it's terrible or not terrible. How, how do you analyze it? I don't think it's that significant. I understand it. Uh, you look, uh, there's... Anybody who's really analyzed this knows that Israel has every right to do what it said it's going to do. And by the way, we're just talking about plans now. They're, they're not out there with shovels and, and concrete. Uh, the only criticism I've heard was the timing of it. And you can argue both sides. I think Israel felt they were burned at the UN. They were betrayed at the UN. You heard all the speeches of the world community just 
knocking the you-know-what out of Israel. And, and, and it was Bibi saying, you know, we're the masters of our destiny. Uh, was it diplomatic? No. Popular uh, in Israel. And it was popular in Israel, you know, just was like, it just, it like yeah, just like Abba Abbas plays to his domestic uh, audience. The Israelis do the same thing. Bibi I wants think to it, be reelected. I don't okay. think it's such. You do know there were American Jews who were very upset by this. No question. Yeah. Okay. What's your what's your analysis? I think people do not understand the difference between uh, announcing something that might take place in 2014, 2015, and pulling out bulldozers. Uh, yeah. In other words. Uh, Essentially, it's a uh, you know it's almost a kind of negotiating tactic, if you will. Of uh, you 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 launch a you launch a certain position, and uh, if negotiations will take place, there are things we'll talk about. But the actual on the ground consequences right now are next to yeah. nil. Unfortunately, I, I think the dominant reaction, you know, has been to say this is petulant, childish, or again not understanding that it really doesn't have any consequences in terms of what actually No, but the happening. uglier part is this. The uglier part is that those same European nations that abstained or voted against it called Israel in to condemn them, called their ambassadors <laughs> in on the carpet. Israel, again, was, as opposed to calling those ambassadors into Tel Aviv or into Jerusalem, from Tel Aviv into Jerusalem, to say, how could you vote for this after Abbas made his speech, which I call a blood right. libel. That was literally a blood libel. That at the United, United Nations. Nations. To say nothing of taking the very Israel should have called those ambassadors the in to Jerusalem, from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, you know, make, and, 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 say, and, make, and say, please, account for your, for your actions. And make no mistake about it. The reason the European nations hauled the Israeli Six, ambassadors yes. in was because the U.S. pushed them to do it. There's little doubt about that. I think the significance... I'm sorry, say it again. The, the European Certainly countries... Certainly rumored to that. Yeah. Well, I've heard... The of Israelis really that, believe it, I know. Uh, that it, it was that the, the Americans, who were really irritated yeah. at what Bibi announced... Because it was a slap against America. Got, got the Europeans to put the squeeze on the Israelis. But I think one of the significant aspects of, of this whole issue is it puts into focus what's really going on. Because the reaction to this E1 announcement, and as Steve said, there are no bulldozers out there. It crystallizes what's going on. This, this uniform attack against Israel at a time when, look what's happening in Syria. Right, look what's happening right. in Egypt. Look what's happening all over. And somehow the single greatest threat <laughs> is a plan. to world peace uh, uh, are some, some, some plans. And, and by the way, Abbas made noises. Whether he follows through, I don't know. He was basically saying this is an act of aggression right. on the part of Israel, and we might bring him to the court. And the talk is that they're going to do it in combination with the Turks. Yes. They very well might. I don't know. Would it I, surprise I you? No, nothing would surprise me, although... Uh, it would neither surprise me nor particularly surprise sadden me, me. What would surprise me would be as if the, the, the world opinion sided with Israel. Uh, <laughs> Israel is, uh, I think, in many... Uh, you know, it's really ironic. Israel is flourishing. <laughs> it's strong economically. Uh, and yet I, I don't remember a time in my lifetime at least when Israel was more isolated in terms of Neil, the world going Neil, against I them. went... A few By the way, that's, ago. that's an extraordinary comment. I know. You do not remember a time when Israel has been as isolated as At it is today. At least appears to be as isolated. Diplomatically. In term, yeah, what about in the Zionism as racism, racism resolution? 35 mm -hmm. voted. No, I, 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 I... 35 voted for the, on the Israel side for that. And yeah. uh, 72 voted no, I, 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 for the resolution. Zion, Zionism is racism. racism means Israel has no right to exist. Right. Now you're, we don't uh, want racial Steve, I, I stand yeah. corrected. But in terms of internationally, in terms of these repeated attacks, not just at the U.N., when they start schlepping the Israeli ambassadors to meet the, the foreign ministers, saying, you know, what are you doing? But, Threats. I, I, and and you know, that was why when you look at the plan and you listen to what Bibi said, they're criticizing Israel for nothing. The plan, we might as well build. The plan. They're not the, going to do any worse. The plan is not significant. What it shows, in my mind at least, I respectfully suggest, is that something which should not be an issue is enough to garner such widespread antagonism publicly, diplomatically, diplomatically. against Israel. You're, what you're really saying is the contempt for Israel 
uh, exists irrespective of this, and this is essentially a trigger. And th this and is what—that what, that is what I would be concerned about. I, and, and, and I think it's true. And in you know, some it's, way, okay, it, it in some way, it. yeah. What this group is saying is that the UN vote is the most significant event in the Jewish world of 2012 because of this. That was my point initially. It's yeah. about what, the it represents. Of what it represents. Of what it represents. What it represents, even more than and, what it may and uh, in the future. do on the ground. And in the future. Okay, we're going to have to pause. Okay. I have the great pleasure of sitting with Micah Halpern, Stephen Bain, Neil Scher, and Susie Rosenbluth to take a look at the events of 2012. We're going to pause. They will join us next week to conclude this discussion. I hope you're with us. I always ask you, you've heard what they have to say. If you have any thoughts or comments of your own, what do you feel the importance of the UN vote was? And in general, what do you feel were the most significant events of 2012 as they impact the Jewish world? Please email me, write me, post on our Facebook wall, tweet me. I look forward to hearing from many of you. Until we meet again next week to continue the discussion, I'm Mark Golub. L'chaim, my friends, to life. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support Shalom TV with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double chai or more, to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media. Simply visit the Shalom TV website homepage and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check made out to GEM, to GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive on DVD with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.